turn the battery down on the old camera. Hopefully we can uh, get a little more life out of it. We'll see. Yeah. But how are you, man? I'm good. Good. I'm yeah. good. Feels good to reboot this thing. Been a while. Yeah. Mm-hmm. I mean, I think it's only fair that the reboot happens off a cell phone. <laughs> from, yeah. From the dungeon. Nothing. Get us <laughs> back, get to, us back to the roots. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> oh, yeah. 100%. See where this thing really started. Yeah. <laughs> a couple of guys in a basement in Northwest Iowa. <laughs> well, and I was thinking about that. The first couple episodes we did... We're in 2018, in like the late summer, yeah. early fall 2018. And that was with the Grems boys and myself. And then you jumped on shortly, shortly thereafter. thereafter. Like that fall, you were yep. in on it with us. So, yeah, man. Yeah. No, it uh, feels good to do stuff besides work. And well... Then no like be gone for a weekend. I feel like we're never around. Yeah, right now. You traveling a little and a lot, or what's going on? We're just we got stuff. Like I don't know. In laws have been up to help paint the house, and we've been to my grandma's, and then we'll have something with my folks for a weekend, mm. and then it's a work weekend. And this is a work weekend, but sure, you know, four hours. I'm going to have a lot more work weekends. My retired pharmacist we brought out of retirement is retiring. Again? Again. He's going to, this time he's going to let his uh, license lapse. So okay, so he's done, done. He's done, done. Yeah, I've I've done what I could trying to get the text to butter him up. But <laughs> so, yeah. come on, Denny, you got a pretty good deal here. But well, I suppose. Yeah, he's put his time in. I get oh, it. Oh, hell, if I was in his shoes, I would have retired 10 years ago. Yeah. And dude's in his 70s. <laughs> let, him, let him go. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it keeps him busy, though, so I don't well, know. good. I told, talked to old Cole today. I might have to, I'm going to try to talk Bill Beards into working for picking you a up bit. Some, picking up some shifts, yeah. Because you kind of need, like, a Saturday guy, don't you? Is you that need, the deal? Or? Well, yeah, and I don't mind weekend rotations, but every other is rough. Yeah. Like, that marries you to town every yeah. every other weekend. And it's hard to <clears throat> flip-flop because then you end up working two in a row. Right. Um, with only, so and you're just living down there, and then you just live at the pharmacy. Yeah, yeah. and it's not—it wouldn't be so bad. Like Amy said, she wouldn't really mind it because she's part time. You know? Okay, she's only 20, 25 hours a week. Oh, okay. Mine's like forty-six. Yeah, and then it goes up to fifty when I work weekends, yeah. and then if I have a board meeting, it's fifty-two, mm-hmm. and then you know, all of a sudden. All of a sudden, I'm working a whole buttload, but that's kind of a hard, kind of a niche spot to try to fill. Uh, yeah, like a weekend guy, you right? Because the the other pharmacists I that I could get are all full timers, and they're like either don't work weekends, in which case they don't want to. Yeah, <laughs> you know, you can get away with not. Right. <laughs> like we had an an intern who's she's down in like Hartley now, and they aren't open on the weekends. She's got it made. She, she, you know, she'd love to work for our pharmacy, but she's like, listen. Yeah. <laughs> I got the Monday through get, Friday, nine to five. Wonderful. Leave work at work. Mm hmm. Yeah, I get it. And I do too. It'll, yeah. it'll end up working out. We'll figure something out. No. Oh, yeah. Well, that's the, the hell of the running the small businesses. You just got endless employee yep. questions and, Headaches and stuff. And, and turnover. Turnover. God. Oh, yeah. We got another new one now. Uh, we uh, lost a tech. She quit and went up to the courthouse. And uh, so then we picked, we moved our cashier gal over to technician and hired a new cashier gal. Mm-hmm. But I think, I feel like we got a solid team now. So hopefully we can avoid, avoid oh, that good. turnover. It's uh, hiring's a bitch right now. Oh, I dude. bet unemployment's three yeah. <laughs> percent in Iowa, yeah. in less than Emmett County, probably. Yeah, you know, right? It's uh, <laughs> people who looking wa- no, who want people who want to work are working. <laughs> oh yeah, <laughs> and, oh definitely. And it's hard being a small business because you don't have that uh, you don't have that benefit 
capacity yeah. that, that some of the large employers Well, do. and, you know, people can go to a quick star or they can go to a oh, yeah. whatever and get 15, 17 something. 17 an hour? 17 an hour. Full corporate benefits, like get good the, health insurance, right, you 401k, know. PTO, yeah. Yeah, and quick stars. You know, that kind of changed Esterville's game. I feel like when that came into town, starting everyone at 15. Yeah, uh, I think it forced a lot of people 17. to bump up. Yeah. Oh, big time. We, we've no, we've only been open two and a half years, mm-hmm. and we bumped up about two bucks across yeah. the board. Yeah. Um, you know, I think there's a lot to say for, like, enjoying yourself at work and finding meaning in your work mm-hmm. that quick star might might always not fulfill for yeah, folks right you know and like my tiff my head tech says you know she worked she managed a truck stop up in jackson for years like okay st- 10 years and she, so she like, knows that that game then oh, pretty it's well the worse i <laughs> bet <laughs> dealing with truckers <laughs> is is a quick star here? Is they are they like twenty four hours? Do you know? Is it? Uh, I think so. Okay. Yeah, I think they're. If they're not twenty four hours, they're they're Open close. Pretty late. Yeah, yeah. like a le- may, They might close like eleven to five or something yeah. like that. But um, because I know they do overnight parking down there for the for the big rigs. And, yeah, right. They got some slots in the back or something. I've seen yeah. people pulled in there. So yeah. Well. <laughs> Cole Beardsley's uh not I wouldn't call him a stalker, but some guy was like <laughs> texting Cole or like message oh that's what it was. It was message boarding on his like Iowa Lakes class. <laughs> like just being a real creepy, but he was like living at the truck stop. Okay. Was that it? Maybe I'm thinking of the different kids. He, didn't he get in a big argument with somebody on a class or something? Yes. Is that the same and guy? Cole, Cole jumped in and <laughs> being Cole. Yeah. Cole John Wayne the, John, the, John the Wayne situation. said, come find me. I got guns or some shit. <laughs> <laughs> My favorite kind of liberal dude. Just <laughs> Hey, so, he's the Duck Dynasty Democrat. He is so. the Duck Dynasty Democrat. <laughs> that's how. That's just how he is. I yeah. just, I just, I, I have a feeling his local politics career can't be over. No, like yeah. I'm not ready for it to be over. The people are are clamoring oh, for hundred for some Cole Beardsley. He's just got to keep running for stuff. That's it. Yeah, you know, eventually you'll get one where there's like 17 votes. And between you, me, Kyle Grimms. And yeah. And then I our can, 40 listeners here on the podcast. That's right. We'll uh, get them over the threshold. Project Ion Girl. Mm-hmm. I know you, I know you got the ping. <laughs> <laughs> You'll get the ping when there's this new episode out. Oh, yeah. You make sure to let us know what you think about Cole Beardsley. Mm-hmm. Or Kyle. I think Kyle would make a, a good uh, city council yeah, member. Kyle, or... I just want to see Kyle in any situation in which he's under pressure. That's y- yeah, that's the best. That, so it is. We should fill in the audience on all the Kyle drama here, Andrew. Uh, yeah, I, I agree. So People are wondering. Well, so we've been talking about rebooting the podcast, and the little the background information here is that we're starting a band. Band practice is kind of taking over the bunker. Yeah. So I moved the computer out of here and everything. So the old podcast setup has been basically torn down, and we've just been on hiatus for like four or five months. Just looking whatever. for a venue. Looking for a venue. So I was laying the foundation for this a few weeks ago, <laughs> and I was like, Kyle, you got this huge house. Big basement. Big basement. You know, I think I can kind of design like a mobile, quasi-mobile podcast sure. set up whereby, you know, we can just kind of show up, hook up to a laptop or something, get it going, and it'd be basically the same product as what we had before. Yep. And he said, yeah, that's great. You know, we'll, we'll, we'll do that. That'll be all, all good and everything. Got his permission. He got permission. Got his permission, so... Anyways, we had no band practice this week because of reasons. So I'm like, okay, perfect opportunity to reboot the cast. So I say, Kyle, can we uh, can we do the podcast today or, you know, whatever? <laughs> yeah, man. He's for it. 
all for it, you know. And it, it was in the tech. It was in the group text. Kelly happened to be out of town. Yeah, Kelly was out of town. It was going to be perfect. We Didn't all have could, any date nights. We all could come over, and it uh, was just going to work out great. It worked out like every nobody was busy. So here's our chance. So I sent him a message earlier today. I'm like, we cast in today, or what's the deal? We in? No, I can't. <laughs> <laughs> was basically the response that's that's verbatim <laughs> verbatim what he did so, <laughs> he missed anyways, Wes Grimm's did <laughs> I was just like god damn it like, <laughs> okay fine whatever so get a hold of Andy here we are but of course this is a, a diet version of what we'd be doing otherwise but uh, here's one for you so Kyle and I have been playing. We've been on like a three-day game of Would You Rather, and yeah. it is just going haywire. Getting so, off the rails a little mm-hmm. bit. Oh, goodness. So, oh, goodness. I mean, or you know, like hypothetical. Oh, yeah. Like here's a situation. And, you, you know, what I mean, you do? naturally, of course, this stuff has a tendency to kind of like take itself into a sexual realm or oh, whatever. Yeah. You know, I mean, that's oh, yeah. just how it goes. Yep. So we, we start off with the premise of it's basically like you're blindfolded okay. and you're going to get a beach. Okay. And it's a 50% chance it's, you know, like Taylor Swift and then the 50% chance it's Boy George from the Culture Club or oh. something like that. So the idea... That would trip his trigger. <laughs> <laughs> so the idea is... So that that's his thing he's offering to me, right? Okay. That, that's All the right. hypo. All right. And <laughs> I just, you know, being a lawyer, I'm just like, okay, this is a negotiation. That's exactly what it is. <laughs> I'm just going to say no, you know, just so I just keep saying no to everything. No. <laughs> and he's like, okay, fine. 60 40. Okay. 70 30, you know, and it's just going back and forth. And I'm just like, nope, nope, you're get, nope. But nope. you're getting the, you're winning the negotiation. I'm winning every. You're, you're, you're getting concession here. <laughs> Bear in mind. <laughs> At no point is this about any of the incentives that he's offering. Oh, yeah. It's all about him just getting me to be like, okay, yeah, I'll get a beach from Boy George. Be like, oh, you would. And so, and yeah, so then he can get on his phone and be like, oh, interesting. It's just, uh, interesting. <laughs> Didn't know that about you. Have you ever thought about that about yourself? Mm, you for know. 10 years. You would hear that for 10 years. Dude, forever. <laughs> and spe- 10, we've been playing this for 15 <laughs> You know, this it's been around and around like this. So it's going on and on and on. Days this is going and we're still playing really. And by now I'm getting like a monthly stipend. It's ninety five five percent, you know. It's the tax free, the stipend goes up with inflation, you know, like <laughs> finally I poison pill the thing and I'm like, All right, Kyle, there's only one way. That you're going to get me to agree to get a beach from Boy George. And that's if you get a beach from Boy George first and you upload it to Pornhub. And uh, <laughs> and uh, that way I can, you know, threaten to send Kelly the link every time you turn around or that's whatever. Right. Yeah. And he, of course, and you just... <laughs> Nothing. <laughs> you won that negotiation. Oh yeah. <laughs> you know, it was child's play. I mean, come on. Like I, I do that all day, every day. <laughs> he, uh, God, he cracks me up though. <laughs> Especially when like Kyle Grimm's things happen to Kyle Grimm. Oh yeah. The great. whole, the whole outing himself about the nectar. Oh, that was classic. That it was just, just. <laughs> The, the the golden example. <laughs> so he's just like, no way am I signing up for this stuff. This is the hill. This is the hill this that I'll is die the hill. on. We got him to say that. Got him to say it's on the record. On the record. Like, I'm like, are you sure this might create this some negative it. attention for yourself? This is it, Kyle. <laughs> and it's like the the, the, the first. <laughs> even hint of some scrutiny over the whole thing like somebody's like well somebody didn't sign up or something somebody, we, we don't know who but one teacher <laughs> did not sign up and because he didn't sign up he didn't know <laughs> that everyone else gets a notification <laughs> when someone signs up 
starts an, an email blast. Welcome, Let's welcome Kyle Grimms to the <laughs> Teacher the Dr. Obedience Points program. Dr. Family. <laughs> Oh, good stuff. I got to get in on this education grift, though. When I heard the figure surrounding Nectar Point purchase. Oh, yeah. I think it was an expensive. uh, $20,000. You can buy a lot of trans people books. Oh, yeah. For 20K. Think of all the porn you could put in the in the library, in the library with that kind of money. In I mean, the library. That's... I have seen uh, some states are starting to get bit in the butt by that a little bit. Because uh, mm. apparently in Utah they have Bibles in their school libraries. I didn't. Is really? that a thing? Like around here? I never. I mean, maybe it was there. I don't know. I, yeah, I don't know. I don't know. But apparently now. A group. I don't know if it's like Satanic Temple or one of those, one of those kind of groups that mm-hmm. brings brings lawsuits against laws they don't like. Right. Just make, make do something absolutely ridiculous mm-hmm. that no one can be okay with. And yeah, we got to put a little statue of <laughs> Baphomet here up Baphomet's on the. Baphomet's got to go next to the Easter the... Bu- uh, Jesus Easter. Yeah. It's got to <laughs> need a little more blood on that, please. So well, now they're they're yeah. saying you know that. Needs to be banned for graphic sexual content <laughs> and providing uh, abortion uh, abortion uh, instructions in the Old Testament. You know, it's a weird book. Yeah. It's a weird eclectic, right. like... Yeah, you know, I'm remembering from history and stuff in undergrad, I think, I want to say it was the Council of Nicaea, maybe? Yes. They picked the books. Where they picked the books, basically, of the Bible. Yes. And I don't know, was that in, like, I want to say year 300-ish or something? It was Sounds right. It was into the Roman Empire ways because it was post-Constantine and yes. the, the Romans had all converted to Christianity, basically. Right. And I think Catholicism was around, like... 350, 400. Okay. And I think it was pre Catholicism. Okay. Could um, be. Yeah. In in Rome. I took a I took a J term class. It was Rome it was uh not Roman, Jesus. It was historical geography of the Bible. Oh, that'd be interesting. Which was kinda rad. We we did like Greece and Turkey and went around all these places that Paul Paul wrote a bunch of letters in the new testament mm. ephesians so we went to ephesus corinthians we went to corinth mm-hmm. thessalonians checked out thessaloniki turkey um and all these places but then we did uh we did like not just christianity we did ancient greeks so we went to like delphi um olympus okay those kind of places and then we did muslim Areas, oh, so okay. like in in Istanbul and all the mosques mm. and all that kind of kind of stuff, and it was kind of interesting. Oh, I bet uh, putting it into context. But there were these crazy monasteries in Greece called in a, in a, in a region called Meteora that looks like, and that you've probably seen pictures of these things. They look like giant fingers of rock sticking out of this kind of plane. And then these monasteries are built on top. Oh, and they okay. were established around that hmm. three, four, five, six hundred AD era. Mm-hmm. Where there it was like a rock climber monk like went up with a picnic basket one day and like decided to stay hmm. and then all his buddies joined him and eventually they're like pulling each other up in baskets. Wow. Five hundred feet up this up these cliffs. But I met this there was a, one was a what's a nunnery, is it a nunnery? I think that might be the it word. It might yeah. be a nunnery. It mm-hmm. was nuns on top of one of them, and this old little Greek lady, she's like four foot, tiny little thing. Mm-hmm. She's kind of chit chatting through our translator and telling us about this library they got, and they got a book. She said, "I got this book. This book talks about what Jesus looked like." Hmm. I'm like, well, that'd be kind of interesting well, sure you know get yeah. a little closer back to the time see what they say and yeah you know probably an arab fellow 
Was it a, yeah. You know, know, he's a semi. (laughs) He he wouldn't look like he was from Norway. I think that's probably for sure. Well, don't tell that to the good looters. Yeah. The good looters out there. I know. White Jesus. I know. Well, everybody wants their Jesus to look like them. Yeah, I've been Korean, to a, you know, Korean Jesus. There's black Jesus. Black there's, Jesus. You know, yeah. So I get it. Yeah. And maybe the metaphor there is just that a God you know, is a God. God is, all you know, right. Yeah. Is, yeah. Well, that's an interesting thought. So, but, uh, you know, the thought, the Council of Nicaea thing, when they're selecting works to go into the mm. text that becomes kind of the modern bible eventually i always wonder about what stuff was left out yeah like what didn't make the cut it's interesting stuff uh if you look up the, some of the stuff in the dead sea scrolls mm-hmm. dead sea scrolls uh the book of golly i went down a rabbit hole one time and i think it was during my dan brown phase and yeah when dan I, brown stuff when yeah. i was looking when i was learning a bit about uh the Knights Templar, mm. etc. Yeah, I'm but, still playing the Assassin's Creed series on Xbox. It's fantastic. Oh, yeah, if you it's, like that kind of stuff, it, it's it, great. It, it is fun, man. Those are my favorite kind of games, the uh, third-person adventure style. Yeah. You know, when you're running around doing stuff and whatever. Sidebar, uh, there's been a tease recently. There is no E3 any, this year. I oh, uh, don't know okay. if you heard that in the mm-hmm. gaming community. E3 is the huge yearly showcase oh yeah everything that's coming up right and so they dropped a teaser of a third person adventure adventure rpg kind of think god of war style okay. uh teenage mutant ninja turtles game Ooh. modeled off of the there's this graphic novel called the last ronin okay and uh you play as a turtle and your brother turtles are gone but they don't like let on who you are, okay, or anything. And I am jacked. That sounds cool. Yeah, a AAA studio. They won't say who, mm. like what studio got it or whatever. Okay. Um, but you know, if it's if it's anything like the new God of War, which was spectacular. Did they show us a little gameplay or anything like that, uh, or just... a little bit? Okay. A little bit of gameplay, mostly uh, teasers though. Okay. They they talk about how you know you'll get to use all the weapons, so you can see and... the size, the Ooh. katanas, the nunchucks. The Ooh, bow. nice. Um, and that the the other turtles will make appearances, but they're kind of vague in terms of if it's like flashbacks. Or if it's like they're like spirit turtles mm-hmm. or some some cool shit like that, yeah. yeah. So I'm I'm jacked. That's a that's a buy for me. For oh sure. yeah, that sounds fun. That's a pre order probably. Mm-hmm. But I've been still obsessed with Destiny and got Kyle's back on. Okay, well Kyle's good. First person shooter, and he mentioned you're getting a. PlayStation. Yeah, I gotta just pull the trigger on yeah. it and order one. That's are they sitting on shelves or they are there? Okay, yeah. you well. can go to a Target. Um, not sure, probably Walmart things like that. I mm-hmm. think they're around now. Okay, yeah, that's that. That was my big hang up. Is like go through the pain in the ass. I, you know, one. exactly. Yeah. The last, if you want my money, make it easy for let, me let to... Me, let me go purchase one on a Saturday. Right, you know, exactly. <laughs> yeah. And I get with COVID and the chips and all the excuses and stuff, they could, but I, frankly, I I kind of think it was just it was engineered a, scarcity. Oh, than yeah. Anything else, so... Yeah, and I think they used, you know, they, they had the easy out with the chips... They blame it on that. Mm-hmm. And then they have the easy out of, like, everyone's working from home, so everyone's just playing video games all day. Right. Right? So, huge demand. Huge yeah. demand. No one's leaving their homes. Yeah. But, well, I want to get the Harry Potter game. That looks good. I'm, I'm deep in it. Yeah? Is, deep it, is it, it cool? It is. Yeah. It's a lot of fun. It looks uh, sweet. I was watching some gameplay of it. Super open world. Mm-hmm. You can go anywhere at any time. Yeah. Um and and fly and stuff, you know. You got your hop broom. on your Nimbus two thousand. Yeah, you and, got yeah. your you got your broom, or you got a like a buck beak. What are those critters called? Hippogriff. hippogriff. Yeah, you got, a, you got a hippogriff. You can pull out of your magic bag, like the the bags from uh, magical creatures. Mm. You got one of those suckers. Whip out. Did you read all the Harry Potter books? Back I read in the, the day? books. Oh yeah. yeah, 
Oh yeah, I was big in it. Yeah, I, uh, I went to a midnight release in Iowa City with my cousin one time. Nice. I can't remember if that was book five or six. It was getting to the point where I was like, I don't know if I really want to do this, but I won't be in college for a few more years. So like, yeah. But yeah, those books are great. They're really good. Yeah. Well, it with a, like a lot of things for me, I enjoyed it pretty thoroughly from start to finish. I was late to the party because Coral was like, oh, you got to read Harry Potter. And I'm like, no, 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 no chance. No, no chance, chance, Coral. So I, st- <laughs> I started like, I, I, I want to say I was maybe like a junior or senior in high school before I even read the first book. Sure. And then, of course, I'm like hooked on it, but I don't want to let anybody know because, oh, yeah. you know, Harry not Potter cute. is not cool, you know. Yep. But I'm reading all these books clandestinely, you know, and uh, and stuff and uh, whatever. But I just burned through them. Yeah, like they they were quick, quick, quick burns. reads. Yeah, yep. give myself a migraine usually because yep. I've been reading for 16 hours. Just up. <laughs> yep. <laughs> exactly. But uh, I don't know. I sort of got to the point with it where it's almost like a sunk cost fallacy to a degree i was sort of like yeah. you know i've spent this much time i just gotta keep going you gotta know? do it yeah. gotta see how it ends <laughs> and i do have to say when they pull out like all the whole uh horcrux thing like never saw any of that coming Mm-mm. and then looking back like they planted the seeds so like the things yeah. the little pieces were there once you kind of knew what you're looking yeah. for which i thought was kind of the genius of her and what do you think it was a thing that she was conscious of, you know, from the get go? Like, did she have a big picture story I, arc? I never did because, you know, when I first read seven, maybe six and seven, and they started really like they dove into that, and that's where she's going with it. I'm like, well, that kind of seems like she pulled it out of her ass. Yeah. And right. then, but then looking back after a reread and after, you know, the movies and all that jazz, mm-hmm. like, a lot of it made more sense to me that it was yeah. a giant story arc. Um, I find it interesting. She hasn't written anything else. Yeah. And I mean, she's a billionaire. She well, has, she has a billion dollars. She doesn't yeah. have to. No. Um, and maybe it's just like, this is my thing. This and, is my swan song. You know, this is the magnum opus here. And there you go. And there's got to be a fear there, right? When you write the most popular book series ever created. Oh, yeah. How do you follow that? Right. Exactly. <laughs> like, you don't just fart out something else. And I mean, you'd sell a billion copies, but right. it'd tarnish your legacy. Yeah. <laughs> you it's know? like, remember that sophomore slump? Right. Yeah. <laughs> that, Series uh, two. <laughs> yeah. JK Rowling came out with. Now she just makes the uh, LGBTQ community pissed off Mad. all the time on Twitter. Yeah. Yeah. I didn't even know about that. And I went and bought, bought Harry Potter. And I was talking to Yukasik about it, and I can't remember. <laughs> I can't remember because he he's not a big book guy, but liked all the movies. Mm-hmm. And at one point, when I moved back to Estrel, he's like, "Hey, you got all those Harry Potter books still?" I'm like, "Oh yeah, dude." And I'm like, "I got the collector's edition that came in a chest. And oh my yeah, grandma bought it for me." Yeah. <laughs> he's like, "I kind of want to read them." All right, cool. You know, feel free. So I thought he'd be excited about me getting the game. <laughs> what was what's the slur for a transphobe? God, it was a good one too. I don't know. He calls me this weird slur that <laughs> that people. <laughs> you know, it's trap, so I'm kind of used to it. But people have been calling J.K. Rowling, and I had no clue because I try to stay off of Twitter. Oh, Twitter is a cesspool. You know, it and it. <laughs> hasn't gotten better well no no, of course (laughs) not i mean the the problem with twitter is the people who use twitter it's not it uh, is the it is (laughs) people are awful (laughs) it it suffers from the same issues that other social media has and it's just that you know there's people have a platform for getting stupid stuff out there that they haven't earned or anything like that, you know. I'm like, they didn't do anything necessarily to garner all this attention. Yeah, and I yet here's my dumb thought or my dumb video or whatever it might be. Well, and I, I guess I never dove into Twitter or Instagram uh, either, or really heavily 
early or or yet yeah um have both don't use them regularly but i didn't understand how big some of these like influencer personalities oh my god and then the money they make it's insane it's very it insane asinine jake yeah. paul who i didn't know who he was yeah i i i recognized him from vine Mm -hmm. which is where I think he and his brother got started yeah. on like way back and which is a precursor to almost TikTok. Right. Kind of the video yeah. thing. Yeah. But that dude's worth like a billion bucks too. Mm -hmm. He spends like 10 million on a Pokemon card. Right. Or this Mr. Beast guy? Mr. Beast is yeah, it's the the velocity of his money. He was on Rogan. Mm -hmm. And I was just listening and like that dude just pumps everything back into his company. And his his channels, multiple channels, because mm -hmm. now he's in like a billion languages too. Probably worth ten billion dollars. Yeah, yeah, it's crazy. <laughs> the publicity. Yep, and so much of the stuff is just goofy. Like, yeah, here, put your finger on the car, and then the first one to you take your finger, you know, then like, and he'll get a hundred million views. Get a, yeah, hundred million people will watch that. And I think that's what he was talking about on Rogan was that he and his buddies like just decided like, this is what we want to do. This mm -hmm. is how we want to make money. How do we do it? And then they just deconstructed the algorithm. Yeah. And like what makes people like, what looks good on a clip? What are going to make people click on that clip? How do you get them to watch past this amount of time, yeah. which is where you make more money or some, right. some such thing. Yeah. And then it just it's all the science to everything takes off. And mm -hmm. he like, you know, I watched one the other day where he made a uh, Willy Wonka factory <laughs> and <laughs> had all these people doing like yeah. Willy Wonka games for a hundred thousand dollars or mm -hmm. something like that. <laughs> and he makes several million. Well, it's the same as a game show, I guess, basically, all, right. you know, similar concept. People tune into but I think the thing that strikes me is the like the exponentially larger amounts. Mm -hmm. You know, Wheel of Fortune, someone wins big, they win like fifteen thousand yeah, dollars. Right. Like these yeah. guys fart fifteen thousand mm -hmm. dollars. Yeah. <laughs> or they're driving, you know, you see uh some of those other nerds driving around in a Bugatti. Mm -hmm. I'm like, dude, you're seventeen years old. Yeah. You got a you got a one point five million dollar automobile. Yeah, well, <laughs> kudos to figuring out how to do it right from a young age, I guess. It's interesting because it's, it's clearly like a fad. It's clearly mm -hmm. a trend, right? Yeah. Like, where does it go? I always I try to think where it goes from here. Right. Because I'd always love to catch a wave on something. Oh, yeah. And figure out how you can, how you can do that. Exactly. That's the dream, man. But uh, you just, I think you fail a lot before you figure that out. Yeah, oh, yeah. Well, I had, I wished, because I, I really started watching a lot of YouTube and stuff maybe mm, 10 years ago, I want to say. Uh -huh. That's where sort of when it became, uh, my entertainment source shifted away from TV, I would say, and yeah. stuff like that, and was more geared to like, oh, I can just kind of look for whatever I want. Whatever like you want. Guitar video or... A, George Carlin stand up or something like that. You know what I mean? And that was really the golden age of YouTube because there wasn't uh, as much copyright stuff and there, you right. know, there were the, the censorship <laughs> kind efforts. Of a wild and, west. Right. It was very much a wild west. You could, I mean, I was watching autopsy videos. I was watching oh, yeah. like, you know, all kinds of nasty stuff. And, but it was informative and, mm -hmm. you know, tickled my fancy well so i wish i had gotten into that you know with this kind of stuff podcasting mm -hmm. or whatever at that time because i feel like what had a better shot at right actually getting an audience because well, now it, it's so easy to do yeah. that that everyone does yeah right. and and then you know when everyone does no one can yeah get big exactly you know what i mean the big mm -hmm. get bigger and the small just kind of piddle around in the basement in northwest iowa oh yeah well it's fun it is fun <laughs> gives you something to do i would rather toil away in obscurity and be able to say what i want that's right i think that because i think the more people that watch the more likely you're gonna get like 
publicly shamed. Oh, yeah. Or say something that TMZ will pick up. Right. Exactly. You know, you'll end up like Bam Margera. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Saw a thing. <laughs> Bam Margera. <laughs> Saw a thing on Reddit about him today. I clicked my fancy. I'm like, oh, I wonder what that dumbass is up to. Is he doing better? Or was. Was, okay. Fell off the wagon again? Again, or? yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I think he was for about a month. Steve-O took him out. Like, Steve-O's like 12 years sober now. And yeah, like Steve-O is rebooted his quite career, a... Podcasting out of a van. Interesting guy. Wild man. I mean, he was the dude that you thought would, like, he'll never see 40. No. You know. Not after some of those, like... In, and that's what was crazy, too, because that shit was on MTV. Mm-hmm. Of, like, here's my apartment, and you just see... 20,000 NOS yeah. nitrous cartridges oh, around yeah. everywhere. And yep. <laughs> and he's just clearly fried. Oh, yeah. Way fried. <laughs> and, uh, and and now he's the sober vegan yeah. who's still skateboarding mm-hmm. and podcasting, driving around. He climbed a crane down by SeaWorld during Blackfish stuff and got her he got arrested for that but yeah. he was sober as a judge sure you know making a statement <clears throat> but now he's doing stand-up mm-hmm. which is kind of funny it's kind of a mix of stand-up and like his clips stunts and stuff yeah yeah, yeah. and because he's a he's a genuine circus clown yeah like went trained, to clown college trained to clown college for Burnham yeah. and bailey but he took bam on the road with him as his opener. Oh, okay. And it lasted one show. Oh, dear. And then he twittered the next morning, like, bam, you could have seen your son, but you stayed up all night getting high on Adderall. And mm. and then there was a thing today. He was, like, arrested at a restaurant harassing his ex-wife or something. I don't know. Yeah. No, I, I Deep, deep, dark addiction on that. I dude. Yeah. I'd like to see him. And some CTE, I'm bounce, guessing. But yeah, probably. <laughs> you know, maybe some other mental illness. Uh, yeah, he's diagnosed bipolar. Yeah, so. doesn't take his meds. You know, he. <sighs> it's sad that oh, yeah. like, and it sucks that 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 kind of person has that kind of spotlight. Mm-hmm. You know, just well, and at this point, it's probably more about let's try to get him having a meltdown or something for oh, the clicks for sure. and stuff, you know. Yeah, TMZ so, loves yeah, that shit. Yeah, right. And they've loved that for, I mean, they did that with Lindsay yeah, Lohan. Sure. And oh, yeah, that's their whole brand. All, the, all those nerds. Oh, big time. Even Steve-O. I yeah. He used to follow him around and he'd get oh, of course, yeah. and shit. But it is too bad. And, you know, I I think so finally back to the Jackass people and Bam yeah. and other ones, you know, because – it just reminds me of that time of my life and, mm-hmm. you know, my friends and doing the same kind of stuff, you know, on a smaller scale or whatever. And yep. Having fun, and it's too bad to see people pass away, like Brian Dunn and uh, yep. people have addiction problems and whatever and yep. spiral. But I did see the new Jackass movie. Was it pretty good? It was pretty funny. I got a lot of giggles out of it. Yeah. You know? I mean, it's all the same shit. Same stuff. Same yeah. stuff. <laughs> yeah. Lots of poopy, lots of like ball punches. And yeah. <laughs> flying drones attached to wieners and stuff oh, like yeah. that. You know, classic. <laughs> the formula still works. Like, I still laugh at it. Oh, yeah. <laughs> well, I was watching a clip of some old, just some rerun jackass, and I want to say it was the. They were like dressed up like football players and tackling each other in some bodega or something like that. Or <laughs> yep. <laughs> and the you know like the sixteen year old imp in me is like, hee hee hee. You know this is funny. Oh, yeah. But then you know the thirty five year old man is like, damn kids, get the hell out of wrecking the store. You know it's my store. <laughs> yeah, exactly. This is this guy's livelihood. Dude. Yeah, right. <laughs> <laughs> so it's it's. So interesting how the perspective changes as you get older. <laughs> but uh, nonetheless, yeah, I, I still had to chuckle at it. It, oh, was, yeah. it, was, it was good fun. <laughs> yeah. Oh, yeah. I definitely get to be more of a curmudgeon mm-hmm. the older I get. It's kind of funny. Well, you know, I just I miss watching people skateboard. I uh, yeah, like good skateboarding. Oh, yeah. I remember when I was at Iowa Watch. State, yeah, the people just be shredding around mm-hmm. campus and taking a 10 stair rail or something like oh, that yeah. and you, you don't see it, it was good stuff I nobody does it have anymore. you been down to des moines and seen their new park huh apparently it's huge 
Uh, kind of by the river, I think. Yeah. Isn't it? yeah. Yeah, but it's like one of the bigger ones in the in the U.S. I think, mm. like square footage wise. Wow. Which I never, I mean, never would have called Des Moines, Iowa, right? Being a skate destination. No, I think yeah. they built it for a for a big competition, um, and then now it's just you know the city's park or something okay. like that. But cool. Yeah, seeing that shit in 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 person is incredible. Watching someone fly oh, yeah. over concrete with that kind of control over yeah. the board. Yeah. Mostly because I tried at one point in my life, and I just couldn't do it. Oh, yeah. It was, I was, it was, I was awful. I was a horrible skateboarder. Yeah. It was not good. I think the peak of my skateboarding ability was maybe to, like, ollie up a curb or something yeah. like that. You know, I could just... never get... I couldn't figure out... Couldn't get my feet and my weight to figure out how to get the back wheels up mm-hmm. on an ollie. Yeah. Just could not happen. Like Kevin Taylor beat his head against the cement trying to get me yeah. <laughs> to figure out. <laughs> Just couldn't do it. Yeah. Couldn't well, it's it. a weird and transfer I, of of your weight. Right. And I had a I was strange cuz for like I would ride regular. Let's see. Regular is left forward, left foot, right? Yeah. So I would snowboard regular, mm-hmm. but I skated goofy. That is weird. Very weird. That is weird. Because I, I, I'd always, you know, goofy, have my right foot forward skateboarding. And then, so then I'd ollie, so I'd kick off with kick my with left, your left. left. and Yeah. But I, you know, it was just, it was backwards. Mm-hmm. Snowboarding, I have no idea why. I just Interesting. did it that way. Yeah, I but I don't it. think that did me any favors. <laughs> no. <laughs> no. He probably should have tried to sport. force the regular. <laughs> yeah, <probably. laughs> Until it became feeling a little more natural. Right. But... <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> <sighs> we were talking about the old ski hill out at work the other day. Oh, were you? Yeah. Well, Amy and I are the only two that grew up in us. Ah, so sure. we were like telling them about ski day. And what a freaking oh, dude. shit show that Ski was. day was so dope. There was like four broken arms every time. <laughs> yeah. Always like four broken arms. And the kids who had season passes and your old gear felt so freaking cool. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Against all the nerds on their rental oh, yeah. skis. They'd just be like doing the little pizza. Pizza, you know, pizza going French down fry down Bambi. Yeah. He's like, see you later, bro. We're going to Winding Wheel. I'm going to bomb it. <laughs> <laughs> Go shred some gnar through the woods. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that was so true. Oh yeah, it was. It was, it was just like disparity, though. Like <laughs> flashback here. Oh boy, fifth grade. I want to say might have been first skier. Might have been fifth, maybe sixth grade. Yeah. Either, I was I was snowboarding at that time. And towards the bottom of Bambi, there was a kind of a weird, like somebody tried to make a half pipe or something, but it sucked. And it was just this weird kind of a lip sort okay. of. Off to the right? Yes. And it was by the, that cliff. Yeah. Yes. Down by the cliff. Yes. So okay. they were like trying to use the cliff as one side <laughs> and then this <laughs> shitty lip thing. All right. <laughs> Julie Poiser is doing the pizza fry thing or whatever yeah she's a runner rental and (laughs) josh van langen and i i want to say are doing our like you know 1080 ssx whatever kind of a routine you know (laughs) and uh we hit we're like let's jump the lip thing or whatever and we get down there and do it well poor julie was kind of going by at the same time or whatever (laughs) and crashed and i think broke her leg probably Probably broken bones. Because <laughs> she was just like piled up in a heap. And then we, <laughs> we go on about our business. Oh, yeah. You know, and the next thing you know, she's getting like carted up the hill on gotta, a toboggan. Bob's got to go get the toboggan, bring him up to the ambulance. Snowmobile. <laughs> <laughs> and Bob loved the money, but God damn it, did he hate Ski Day? Oh, yeah. That had to have been horrible. The worst. I can't imagine working there. You bring you bring a hundred kids of a grade yeah, out just skiing. Eighty percent don't know what the hell's going on. Right, more maybe. Mm-hmm. <laughs> yeah. Well, they tried, and I they mean, were, and and then like they were only on that area. 
too. Yeah. So like Bambi was a just like a zoo, and then <laughs> the no other one... hills were yeah. <laughs> oh, that was you know the nineties. It was so different. Just even thirty years so ago, different. It was just crazy. And I can't believe the impact of of phones. Mm. Like it's still weird to me to think. And even with my wife, so Megan's, Megan is, what, five years younger than me? Maybe six. Okay. So she's younger. Mm -hmm. And we were talking about phones one day. I'm like, yeah, I got my first cell phone, you know, when I went to college. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I had, right. my parents had one and I could, I borrowed it in mm-hmm. high school and I'd call them for a ride home or something, yeah. but like absolutely no text messaging. It was a quarter, quarter yeah. a message or some shit. Right. Like <laughs> and she's like, oh, yeah, we got one, you know, when we started high school. I'm like, well, that's, I guess, like the same year. But I was yeah. just that much farther ahead of you. Yeah, like, right. High school, we didn't talk to people on cell phones. Well, it was but, a rarity. There was only a yeah. handful of kids that, like, had them. Cole Beardsley. Beardsley. I think Andy Inman had a yep. cell phone. Oh, yeah. Derek did, I think, when we were in high school. I remember Beardsley had the freaking the little case. It was like a fake flip phone. Oh like yeah, flipped down. Looks like a CIA operative. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but you know, I mean, like somebody whip out their Nokia brick or whatever, and you're playing Snake on it on the oh, bus yeah. or something. Like, Whoa. Like, Whoa, cool. That's cool. And uh, but uh, you know, yeah, I don't know. I I got a phone. Well, it's the same. I've had the same phone number since 2004. Yeah. I got rid of my original um, because I wanted a T-Mobile Razor mm. and moved when I was up in Minnesota, T-Mobile had pretty good coverage. Yeah. And so I'm like, okay, I'll jump on this. Went home for a summer and they sent me a letter saying they were canceling my contract and disconnecting me because I was roaming. Like I had nationwide free, mm-hmm. but when I was in Esterville... You're just I roaming, was the, shit roaming out of every- the shit out of everything. And I was costing them a bunch of money, so they gave me the stinky boot. Oh, <laughs> so geez. I was like, all right, well, Dad, what do you want to do? He's like, well, I guess me and your mom can stop sharing a phone, and I'll get one, too. So he, he and I signed up at Midwest Wireless nice. when that was a thing. Oh, God, yeah, I forgot about that. Yeah, it got bought up. That's a blast from the past. Verizon. Oh, yeah. Um, but... But yeah, I mean, back then it was like call a guy, call someone's house, and yeah, if if you know they're not home, their parents know where they are. They can at least give you a, an approximation. I bet. So imagine a kid, like say a, an eighth grader or something. Yeah, You're like hey man, you got to find your buddy, and here's the only way to do it. You've got to get on your bicycle and ride over to his house and see if he's home. I don't know if they could handle it. No. No, because you don't see that anymore. No. Where are bikes? Yeah. Do they I, even sell them anymore? I, I don't, don't know. I think you can probably buy them, find them at Walmart. But, like, hell, we had we had the Bikesmith. That was a store that only yeah. sold bicycles. Yeah. <laughs> that was it was a entire, bicycle store. Entire business model. And then and then uh, Ace. Had a yeah, whole that's right. whole buttload of, of bikes. That's right. I forgot and, about uh, that. And everyone had bikes or, or a bike or a couple bikes. Well, you know, in the summer, especially by the time I got to like fifth, sixth grade, junior high, whatever. Yeah. Every time, every day I was in Esterville, I would ride my bike into town. Yep. To like... Matt Taylor's house, or to your house, or to somebody's house, whatever. To where you're in town. So I was in town, yep. you know, and yeah, it was just routine. But then you could go anywhere. Exactly. Once you're in town, yeah, the world is your oyster. <laughs> yeah, that's a <laughs> you know? that's a great thing about Astroville is you can start a worldwide <laughs> journey right there in the right downtown there. Esterville. Yeah, you do whatever you want. Yeah, man. You know, there's a Bay's Dairy Deli. Let me go get a Dilly bar over there or go get yeah. some cheese curds over th- I don't know. Run to Casey's quick, get some candy. Oh, yeah. Those were the good old days. I was down at the pool. I used to be able to, like, know, and I, I was such a pool rat, I'd ride down there 
and I could cruise up to the bike racks and know if I wanted to go inside or not. Because mm-hmm. you'd recognize I'd, people's I'd bikes. I'd be like, all right, that bike's here. All right, cool. Yeah. I'll, I'll head inside. Yeah. Otherwise, I'd be like, ah, I'm going to head back home. Yeah, no thanks. Cruise over to someone else's house, see right. what they're doing. And, you know, then the parents would see you when they see you. Yeah. <laughs> well, like, Coral and Senior and I had, like, this kind of standing agreement, like, come home at dark. Yeah. Yep. You know, and if you're not home, if you're not, let us know why. Or call where. or whatever. <clears throat> you yeah. know, and it was a pretty much just on the honor system, and it, it worked. And it worked. We became professional, actual adults. Yeah. Well, with, <laughs> now I think if you turned your say ten year old loose with that lax of supervision you could potentially have DHS up your ass or something. Yes. If your kids are running amok. Running amok or run, you know, failure to supervise or some gobbledygook like that. And And they'll nab you. And that's less than 30 years. Yeah. Because we're what? We're 37. So call us 12. So say 25 years ago. That was the standard. So I I guess the rule now is you can't let your kid out in public if they're under fifteen or something or Which whatever. Is asinine. Without supervision. That is incredible. Well, it is. Yeah, it's very asinine, and I think it's a big problem, and it's going to get worse because part of how people figure out how to relate with one another. Uh huh is you learn kind of the social norms and deviance and stuff like that that you get from unsupervised play as a child. Yes. It's okay to act like this here, Mm -hmm. but if you do that at Fairway, (laughs) your mom's going to hear about it. (laughs) You know? (laughs) Well, and then the same kind of like, you know, the bargains that people make with people, and I'm not talking like a transaction necessarily, but uh, just just the interpersonal behavioral bargains that you make, you know, and the, you know, like kids have a way to settle disputes among themselves. And, Mm -hmm. you know, all of that is laying the foundation for later in later life. in life and and kind of being a a citizen that can interact which is going to it's going to be interesting it and, makes and me nervous almost man almost a little terrifying yeah yeah because these these kids who have been who have gone through this of no fault of their own that's society's mm, issue oh yeah 100% you know? and and to a to a fair point like government issue mm mm-hmm. mhm Especially with DHS. Well, yeah. And and I, I'm, you know, in, in cases where DHS is needed, get them. Oh, sure. You know, no one's arguing that by any means. But these petty ass things that, that can start up and haunt somebody for years and years of their life. Exactly. Well, and it's a, th- uh, I think it's in part maybe a function of government being government in that, mm-hmm. like, it's always searching for a way to justify its existence Correct. and therefore you know we've got our policies and we've got our guidelines and everything and we've got to have bodies to make our policies and guidelines mm-hmm. have meaning or whatever and they're you know and if we don't god we only had x cases last year so they're going to cut our budget and blah 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 so there's an incentive there to push the envelope all the time and try to encompass well for sure because gov- or, because yeah. government thinks it's a free market and people think government should be a free market and that yeah. government should have a product what a way to think about that government, That's interesting. government is not a free market it's 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 the opposite yeah it, it you know it, it it exists and needs to exist to the extent that the public good is served mm-hmm. you know there shouldn't be a quota you know, if there weren't that many cases, we don't need that many people. Right. So maybe that means somebody, there's a budget cut. Maybe that means there's not a job anymore. I mean, right. It's too bad. And it's too bad. But, but that's how it should be. Yeah. And and it can't and it can't be, and it isn't because yeah. that's how people are. Mm-hmm. And 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 for people that work in that area, 
And in other, I'm not not just trying to signal out DHS. Right. I think it's all uh, most government. Oh sure. You know, I think yeah. I think you saying you know it's always looking to a way to justify its existence. That's every every yeah. governmental program. It's or axiomatic for every it, kind of bureaucratic right. channel that government has. You know, right? So. And and that's and that's the crux of the issue. I think is is that then real people are attached to that. Mm. I don't I don't want Joe, my neighbor. To be out of a job because all of a sudden people are taking care of their kids a lot better right. and then we can't justify paying Joe a salary. Right. Like Joe needs a job. Yeah. But at a point, like, yeah, go get a job that produces a good or service yes. that, right. that, that is tangible. Mm -hmm. And then it makes it all about money, but we live in a capitalistic society. Right. You know, I. I am I am in business. Right. Do I wish in in my dream utopian world that there wouldn't be money to be made on medic on medicine? Yep. I do. And is it ever going to be that way? Nope. And mm -hmm. you know, I I'm going to serve but I'm going to try to make money doing it. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, naturally. I mean, it just it plays to Every one of us has got the urge to accumulate resources and mm -hmm. make sure that our own best interests are advanced and that sort of thing. Mm -hmm. And I think that capitalism in its most ideal form seeks to try to ex exploit that uh, human tendency or, you know, whatever mm -hmm. that tr tries to use that to its advantage and you know they say well the rising tide lifts all the boats or whatever you know okay but, but uh it's it's got its problems too i mean oh for sure you know we we can't ignore that but uh yeah of Absolutely. course Unfe you know unfettered capitalism. unfettered capitalism is a disaster it, it is but i and i get i get going on on healthcare because it's what I know. Mm. And I always think of, you know, we don't have, we don't have socialistic healthcare. We don't have capitalistic healthcare. We got this funky chimera mm -hmm. system that, that has been proposed or that has been implemented yeah. here where, where the government is not in the business of healthcare, but they drive all the business of health. Mm. Everything is set off the benchmark standard of Medicare. Sure. Medicare, which is a socialistic type program administered and regulated by the government. Everything is based off that. Like every copay, cost of drugs, mm -hmm. cost of services. W example, we were talking the other day. Um, so in pharmacy you set what's called a usual and customary that's your pricing formula mm -hmm. how you're going to arrive at the price you're going to submit to jimmy's insurance okay government regulations if you accept medicare you cannot be flexible with that usual and customary mm -hmm. so i can't charge you one usual customary and 70 year old coming in for the same medication a different one mm, okay the same number has to be submitted to both okay what the insurance is going to do with that is going to be different for both but because i want to capture the very tippy top of what medicare is going to pay medicare is going to be the most stringent but you want to capture the top the usual and customer is going to be much higher mm -hmm. so for a 30 dollars drug you're going to try to charge medicare 180 and you're going to get what you get. And that's just the name of the game. Okay. In rural healthcare settings that are hugely dependent on Medicare funding, hospitals, same thing happens. So folks with high deductible insurance plans, like myself, if I go in to get a strep test at the hospital, I'm going to probably pay 200 and 200 to $250 because that hospital is going to submit the very tippy top, mm -hmm. try to get that Medicare payment. They, sure. They can't change it either. Yeah. So I'm going to get charged and, and my insurance since it's high deductible, it all going to be a pass through to me. So sure. I'm going to pay 250 just to go see the doctor. Another 150 in labs 
five hundred bucks or four hundred bucks mm-hmm. right there. You know, Medicare to the person doesn't pay it. Medicare pays it, mm-hmm. um, and pays nowhere near that price. But the hospital has to try to capture that. So, a new thing we're gonna try. I was lucky. We're gonna try out is we're gonna do. Uh, we can do test and treat, so we can test for strep and test for flu. We can test for COVID in the pharmacy. Mm. Charge it as a cash business. So say 75 bucks. You come in, take a swab, put it in a rapid test. Yep, you're positive. Then I can prescribe your antibiotic. Oh, wow. Under certain dosing guide. Like they have it all laid out. They're like, you give them amoxicillin, you give them this much for this long time. Well, good. That's the end of me going to the doctors. Yes. (laughs) And and most people. Yeah. Like I think it will be huge because you don't have to wait in a waiting room. Mm -hmm. You have a one-stop shop. And for folks with high deductible insurance plans, which is most young people, I feel like, these days. Oh, yeah. That's going to be a great incentive for them to do that instead. And the uninsured. And, yeah. You can't go into a hospital uninsured and yeah. expect to leave with your pants. Right. <laughs> You're going to take everything. Well, yeah, exactly. Which in in the in Esterville is pretty high population. Mm-hmm. A lot of our Hispanic folks. So you may not know the answer to this. And it's kind of, probably kind of a big question, but... You know, you think back to the days of the doctor making a house call or something like yeah. that, when the, we were, when the doctor was sort of a solo operator in business for himself or mm-hmm. whatever, and it hand you an invoice or something after his yep. uh, time that he spends with you, like the same like a plumber or an electrician or something mm-hmm. like that. When did the shift happen where it turned into this insurance? 1972. The... Really? Okay. Ish. That's a 72, 73. Way better answer than I expected. I figured it was some sort of a gradual shift over time or something. That's but... when health insurance came to the forefront. Mm. That's when we had the wonderful idea as a nation that health insurance equaled health care. Hmm. And and then all of a sudden it became coupled to jobs. You get your health insurance by going to your job, and uh, and from then on the insurance companies were 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 the person to be involved with. Mm-hmm. So you can you still have and in some big cities you'll still have docs. Um, actually, Spirit Lake has okay. a doctor, Doctor uh, Meyer. Okay, Bradley Meyer. Talk about him sometime. Just uh, he's just on his own doctor. Cash only. Okay. Cash only operation. Huh. Interesting. Um, a tech of mine down in uh, Kansas City paid what's called a concierge doctor. So you give this doctor seven eight hundred bucks a year, and then you get to be their patient. They will answer you within X number of hours. They will. Uh, you can go into their clinic within X number of hours. You get all these promises and benefits mm-hmm. for paying a subscription fee, essentially. Huh. That's interesting. And then it's all a cart. It's okay. like, okay, yeah, you have a 15 minute, and we did vitals, and we did this exam. That's going to be this amount. Like, you mm-hmm. get a menu, and this is what you pay. Okay. Whereas if you go to the hospital and try to get a menu, what's this going to cost yeah, me? No idea what anything costs. No one does. No. No one there knows except the billers because it, the billing will then depend on how the doctor codes your visit with all mm-hmm. the diagnosis codes and right. what's the max they can charge for those sure. type things and stuff. And then it's a contract between them and the insurance company. Like, yeah. are they in network? Are they right. out of network? All this gobbledygook. Gobbledygook when we could just pay cash. Yeah. Like, there's no reason that we have to have all of this, all of this nonsense. And it's it's a at was, least yeah. it, in the pharmacy benefits side of things, like it's it's a crazy like un unregulated. Let's see, uh, opaque. And just no transparency in mm-hmm. pricing. Um, and we finally got rid of clawbacks. Yeah. I don't know if I told you about that. They uh, they made that so that our reimbursement at the point of sale is going to be much lower. They're going to just include it then, mm. but they're not going to come back at me four months later yeah. and say, you need to cut me a check for $25,000. Yeah. So it helps budgeting, but it doesn't help the problem. Hmm. Um, but these companies just created themselves and now they've grown to some of the biggest companies in the world. CVS Caremark 
hmm. CVS, the pharmacy giant, bought Caremark, the insurance giant. Wow. And Caremark manages all Blue Cross Blue Shield, hmm. which is, it's 75% of Iowa population. And it's similar in a lot of states. Hmm. Like it's a huge monster company. Was it the insurance lobby then in the 70s that put that together? I mean... <sighs> yeah. And I think it, it had to do... I feel like Medicare was right around then. Because the 70s would have been... Was that Nixon? Carter. Early 70s. Uh, could G- be maybe like Gerald Ford or Lyndon Johnson or something like that. I don't know. I'd, yeah, because Johnson started... When did Kennedy die? 63. 63. Yeah. And he finished out that one and got one more. So, so he that went to 69. Taken, okay. And I wonder if it maybe was like Gerald Ford. And then or, Ford, I think, then Carter. Then Nixon, Reagan? I think or Nixon, Nixon and Carter, Carter flipped, yeah. Reagan, yeah. yeah. And Carter was only a one-termer. So it was sometime in that time period mm. that I think Medicare became... It might have been a thing before, but it became like the thing. The th- okay. Yeah. To like, got to yeah. garner those senior votes. You That's know? an interesting. Yeah, no shit. It's so much. So much <laughs> of the policy is just like, which all driven by these fucking politicians that yeah. just want to figure out a way to stay in office, so they can hang on to the levers of power, and they think, well, let's make up some shit to just bribe people for their votes. Here's the thing, though. Think about this. As our country demographics change, so the biggest voting block now is millennial, right? Yeah. Like, what are we going to get? Where's our stuff? <laughs> yeah, no kidding. You know? <laughs> well, I, in some ways, so people shit on millennials all the time. Constantly. Constantly. Yeah. We're the, uh, the low-hanging fruit i guess as far as that goes but i think that happens though i I feel like everyone shits on like the 30 year olds yeah exactly (laughs) (laughs) and you know in some ways i think the the stereotypes about millennials are probably kind of true a lot of them you know some of the stuff about well people who the work-life balance study millennials are much more concerned with having a you know, I'm not going to be a slave to the office or whatever, mm-hmm. you know, that kind of thing. That's a good thing. That it's not a bad I, That's not a bad at all, a thing at all. <laughs> Just because your boomer ass was down at the office 90 hours a week. When I can get it done. When I can 40. get it done in less or whatever, <laughs> you know, or be a happier person. I right. mean, like. <laughs> and thus a better worker. <laughs> yeah. Like there's, there. that's that's beyond reproach that, yeah. that a good work life balance makes a better employee so yeah right yeah no kidding so i don't know I, but is that is that what is that what this whole thing about uh the loan repayment mm, is going to turn into probably are they going to find a way to try to cram something bigger through because 10k it's great yeah it doesn't touch the issue it's no. not even a band-aid no god of course not you know well and I don't know. I've got mixed feelings about it, but I, I sort of feel like the the underlying issue was in the enabling, I Correct. think, of the universities to go completely haywire Nuts. with their tuition. And, of you know, same as what we were talking about with governments and bureaucrats justifying their own existence. Everybody at the university is figuring out a way to spend every single penny that they've got making up stupid positions and provosts for well, gobbledygook. If they don't use it, they lose it. Right. So, <laughs> and when it's incentivized universities to lower admission standards, to yep. let in anybody with a pulse, yep. and and sign those 18 year olds up for as much, much money, money as they as can they possibly can. borrow because Absolutely. every bit of it is. Just guaranteed by the taxpayers, and it—it's just I—I th- I think the university system, well, really, it's government's fault for uh, setting that loan thing up to where it was, oh, fe- yeah. you know, federalize that loan thing because the universities are just—they're going to take advantage of. And when this. was and when was that? 
when 15, was, 20 years ago, maybe? I don't know. Maybe not uh, even that long ago. I don't know. When, when the federal guarantee thing came out. Yeah, I'm talking out of turn here a little bit. Because I, I, I have no clue. I know, like, my folks' loans were all private. The Like, my mom went down to the Del, first Del High Bank right. or something and, and got a, a regular old loan. And she probably had to prove at the time to the loan officers, like, well, I'm going to major in X and this is my plan to repay everything. And, and, and if I don't, here's my co-signer father who yeah. has this chunk of land or whatever mm-hmm. like that's my collateral yeah yep as it should be and I, I sort of feel like if you went to college in like the 90s maybe maybe mid 90s it was probably a similar program mm-hmm. still where if you had to get student loans it was probably a private thing or maybe some kind of a they maybe had kind of a mishmash of Private, private public, public you know sure but i think by the time people certainly our age and a touch younger were getting into college it was the everybody with a pulse signed you up everybody you know as so, much money as you can yeah here's and what you qualify for tuition so when i went to iowa state it was about Fifty thousand dollars start to finish with tuition, room and board, meals. You know, I rent stuff like that. Yeah, you added up everything. It is it is now a hundred thousand dollars for the same thing in the span of whatever fifteen years ish. That's insane. Doubled in fifteen years. Find me another commodity that's doubled in that time period. Well, and I Besides think you, education. I think you can make a great, a great argument <laughs> that the product is substantially less valuable. Oh yeah, double the money because tw- it's diluted. It's di- it very much so. <laughs> because everybody and their brother has got a bachelor's degree in something yep. because it's so easy to get one. Yes. So yes. it's become meaningless. And 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 so when I was in pharmacy school, there was actually a huge debate on the national stage about the number of pharmacy schools that were coming online. Mm-hmm. That there's just all these private private pharmacy schools because they can make so much money. Like when you get that professional level of right. education, the amount of loans people can get huge is insane. I had a I had a person who graduated in my pharmacy class at graduation had three hundred and thirty five thousand dollars in loans. Ooh. In loans. And and in and it's not just loans, it's the pro, the loan product is yeah. crazy. Right. To think about. Something that is not dischargeable. Mm-hmm. Only thing you can do is die. Yeah literally the only thing right? you can do is die or hope that if you go to a real university you yeah. know there's been some of these that have gotten discharged because right. the university was a fraud or, yeah um some of the online sure bogus stuff but for the most part like you will pay that money until you die because mm-hmm. at three hundred thirty-five thousand, you think of that at so the lowest that their interest rate would be is 8.2 and the highest is probably in the 20s. Yeah. Well, I think... So if you're in that situation where you've got... Like, let's say you're a professional, so you've got some pretty good earning capacity. Mm-hmm. And you've got a big loan balance like that. I think the approach probably is to try to take advantage of one of those buy your loan servicer people that will offer you a lower interest rate. Mm-hmm. And then you can try to maybe pay a touch more for whatever your budget allows and then yep. in time you can chip away at it and, and get it to where it's something manageable but or you try to do one of these pro government programs yeah, that doesn't get it. work <laughs> yeah. you know, have yeah. you looked at the stats on the amount of people who try and fail at getting a PSLF or public service yeah. loan forgiveness whatever it mm-hmm. is like the hoops you have to jump through are insane yeah and it was helped by this whole pause thing because the pause technically counted as an on-time payment even though your payment's zero right 
uh, for those folks. Mm -hmm. That's great. As long as you keep up with the paperwork, as long as you have your finger on it and all that stuff. But I don't know. Something's got to be done. What that is. No clue. Print a yeah. dollar coin and call it forgiven. Like, well, yeah, seriously, the the um the argument of well, you're a consenting adult and you got into this and you signed the paperwork and therefore you should have to pay it back and all the rest of it. Okay, I get that to a point, but I think that mm-hmm. that perspective lacks the nuance in really understanding the big picture in how userous this whole system is right now and was Mm -hmm. when most of this or at least a big portion of this debt was being accrued yeah and and the biggest portion of the debt being accrued is after because the the percentages on that my loans are 8.2 dude that's insane yeah if you would tell me i can borrow money at 8.2 percent in anything else in my life i'd tell you to kick rocks you know (laughs) here's a thought maybe people should start doing this if you've got the wherewithal otherwise outside of your uh you know your job and whatever let's say you maybe got an asset or something at your disposal or you've got enough income to get a line of credit at the bank or something like that Mm mm-hmm Pay cash. Pay, you know, yeah. Pay cash. <laughs> right. Pay cash. Or, or you know, leverage, the, you know, pay, pay off your loan. Maybe maybe there's a way you can uh, get your line of credit going, something like that. Pay off your student loan with the crazy interest rate, something along those lines. And then... The, th- the thing, the problem becomes... I think for a lot of our generation is that the the acquisition of assets. Yeah, you can't get ahead. You can't. Yeah. <laughs> like like that's that's been bumped down the road so much mm-hmm. because the payment on that loan that's already there right has to be paid. You every can't. Month, yeah. Is you can't you can't get any other line. That's or, that's a good point. You know, and I think some of us are lucky and and luck into some things and work hard and get some start getting some assets rolling mm-hmm. but like not to the point where it was in the 80s yeah you don't when have you anything could, to leverage yeah, yeah when you yeah. could when you bought your house for twenty seven thousand dollars and and right. yeah you had to pay 30 percent down or something you know your loan on your house might have been 17 yeah. percent. that's historically mm-hmm. i think more <laughs> in line yeah the interest rates are high right now quote unquote but historically they're still not that bad i mean no when my parents bought in the 70s i think it was 15 or 17 yeah. percent on the on their on their first home they purchased mm-hmm. and uh and at the time that was considered a good loan product yeah whereas now i got locked in at like 2.5 yeah right. <laughs> like i can't afford to move <laughs> my our mortgage on this house is four and a half or something mm-hmm. and our note is not very big frankly I mean, it's low enough. If I wanted to write a check for it, I could. I mean, sure. it's really just, you know. And um, so I'd considered like, okay, well, should I refinance or something like that? And the bank wanted several thousand dollars of fees and stuff to... For paperwork you can do. To, yeah, you know, <laughs> I, I was just like, you know what, eh. Because I, I could have could have refied probably shaved a couple of points off you know if i'd if i'd held on to the house for five if i knew i was going to hang on the house for five or ten years i'd probably make that money back that i spent in fees to shave the points down you know but i wasn't sure if i was going to do that i don't know anyways i just did nothing Mm -hmm. and now i have a pretty good rate still (laughs) Because I mean, it's yeah. in sevens, people are paying yeah. seven. Yeah, it's it's like six seven percent right now, <laughs> and I think it's going to get worse. Oh yeah, I was I, just I was reading an analysis. Actually, there's a Twitter thread clipped onto Reddit today about looking at uh, <clears throat> it was looking at rental market versus home ownership market, and uh, it started with rental construction versus new home construction. Mm-hmm. Rentals way up. Yeah. Way up. 
and then it was looking at uh, price to rent versus price to buy and like what your note plus taxes and all that yeah. was compared to your monthly rent. And, mm-hmm. and uh, uh, you know, in a place like Esterville, you're always going to be better buying than oh, you yeah. have an asset. Right. But in a, in a place that's, you know, like Phoenix, for example, they were talking where historically when, when the housing market drops out, then there's, you know, a hundred thousand houses yeah. for a hundred thousand yeah. dollars <laughs> that are really nice. Yeah. And now cost seven, eight hundred thousand. Right. <laughs> and it's way overpriced. And mm-hmm. it's a, it's it's a slow burst. Yeah. I don't think it'll be a quick one like like the subprime crisis. But yeah. Like uh and also the credit card debt is skyrocketed mm-hmm. again. Yeah. So, yeah, the the bankruptcy inquiries are ticking ticking, ticking back. up here lately. Yeah. yeah, the Trump administration was kind of tough on the uh, between that and the COVID uh, stimmy money and stuff mm-hmm. like that. The, if you're kind of teetering on the edge or whatever, got those, a little, got a few more months cash, out of you. Cash influxes <laughs> were kind of tough on the old bankruptcy business, but yeah, it's starting to tick up again for sure. And I think. Uh, one thing I'm I'm hoping to expand a practice area of mine is to start doing some foreclosure work. Yeah. So I, I think that's likely going to. So as a lawyer, are you come up? So. Do you? There's lawyers on both sides of that, right? There's lawyers for the creditor and for the and for the owner. The in, a, in a foreclosure. In a foreclosure. Okay. Or would you yeah. be working so, for the bank. So usually it's the bank. Okay. So. If uh, you use me as an example, so I quit paying my mortgage now, and um, you know the bank is telling me, "Well, you've got to make your payment," you know, and it usually takes a few months of yeah. nothing and kind of people bugging you and stuff like that. Then they, there's rules that they have to follow as far as Process. giving you notice of you are in a default and, you know, we're construing this as a default. You've got a right to cure. You know, you can cough up a check for the back arrearage and then get and the, fees, and sure. you know, yeah. right, interest and stuff like that. By the time it gets to the point where they actually file a petition for foreclosure, you're usually down the road maybe four to six months i would say from your last from stopping payment. from stopping payment that's actually quicker than i would have envisioned yeah that's and it's quicker I, than an eviction it's it's uh it's quicker the smaller the bank too usually because okay. they're usually on top of that better so if well, it's a yeah. big uh, wells fargo or a u.s bank or something they like can, that they can live without jim Rose seven eight nine payment. months you know <laughs> yeah. a year maybe of back payments sure. you know so here comes a petition for foreclosure. And they're saying, here's the mortgage. Here's the promissory note. We've got it in hand. Here's the title holder. And they've got to make a pretty big effort to name all sorts of defendants. Because if there's any kind of junior lien holders on the property, parties in possession, spouses, something like that, mm-hmm. they have to do their homework as far as making sure anybody that's potentially got an interest in that property is named, is named in the lawsuit and then also gets served so notice that, so, that every, so, that, so that you can't have husband wife husband wasn't paying the note wife didn't right. know about it you can't have something like yeah that. there's all sorts of sure. those instances so typically it's the foreclosing bank that's the lien that's in first position meaning right. they get paid first if there's not the, enough money to go around they're the know. title holder right? they're well they're the one you know what the that lien priority becomes a problem in instances when there's not enough money to cover all the, in, you know. Yeah. So if if the mortgage is for a hundred and then you can only get seventy five out of it, they get seventy. They get seventy five. Anybody that's got a second mortgage or a whatever is hung out to dry, you know. Right. And in those subprime situations, that's when that would really be an important yeah. thing. So that there'd be dispute about priority as you can imagine like who's oh sure who's in fact the first lien but usually it's not much of a discussion because they do a pretty good yeah they do a pretty good job of setting themselves setting themselves that position putting themselves in the right position Mm -hmm. and if the bank was smart when they made their loan in the first place then they made sure to have 
their loan be less than what the property's fair market value would be. That's right. why you get the 20% you down, down or whatever. Bend. Right. Yeah, exactly. Mm -hmm. So it gives them a little bit of a cushion. Yep. So anyways, then after that foreclosure petition is brought, then there's an opportunity where the defendant or defendants can assert defenses or something like that or, you know, do a motion to dismiss or whatever it might be which within that window of time. Which, to me, wouldn't often hold any water. Well, it's pretty cut it's and pretty dry. cut and dry. You, you either you paid or you didn't. <laughs> right. You know. <laughs> like, no one cares that your car broke down. Right. And you, as you said, you would pay this. Yeah. So often that's a non-starter. Mm-hmm. And then you get past that point. Typically, at least in, if when I'm doing debtor work, it takes a while. What I like to do is get in touch with the foreclosing parties and say, you know, here's the situation. We're doing this or that or the other thing. Oftentimes, they'll work with you if you're communicative like that because it's to the bank's incentive to not have the foreclosure actually go all the way, all the way through, through because they'd much rather just get their money and leave mm -hmm. rather than have to dick around with trying to sell, trying a, to sell a house and who knows what kind of shape it'll be in by the time well, they get it. Because that's the thing. This is kicked down the road. If they A think, long ways, right. Yeah. There's lots of debtor protections in between the time the bank initiates and when they can actually have a sheriff sale and take title back. Right. So, um, it takes a while before the next step typically is the plaintiff will come along and say, here's a motion for summary judgment. What that means essentially is they're defenseless. They haven't asserted any defenses. Here we are. We've laid everything out that they haven't paid. We're entitled to a judgment just because we can prove all this stuff as a matter of paper, basically. Yeah. And once that motion is ordered upon, that's kind of the end of it as far as the court work is concerned because they'll do that order and grant it and say the mortgage is foreclosed and direct the sheriff to have a sheriff sale at such time as when yeah. that's when actually the bank like bids their house back, you know, with their <laughs> magic money that they have. Right. But in between that time is when... Wait, so they have to buy it back from the sheriff? Well, it they buy it back, but it's because they they have all this outstanding debt. Right. So unless somebody comes along and bids more than what they need back, the bank gets it, basically. Okay. Does that make sense? Yeah. So if, if the bank's yep. requesting, say, $50,000, and I show up to the sheriff's sale and offer fifty one, then they'll pay the bank back... The 50... The fifty, and, and then I a, get it for fifty-one. You own a house for a thousand dollars. Well, well, or fifty-one thousand. Yeah, and the sheriff makes a thousand. The sheriff will get some fees for having the sheriff sale and serving. <laughs> sure, <laughs> doing their notice service of process and stuff. Does that, like that. happen though? Well, I guess the bank would like that because then they don't have to yeah. dick around with selling a house. So sometimes it, it's all a numbers calculus. So oftentimes the bank wants more i mean the what the bank wants back if you think of that like 80 20 kind of calculus or whatever sure what the bank needs back to get themselves made whole is coming starting to creep up pretty close to probably what the fair market value is right because they've got fees and interest and whatever stacked on top of their mm -hmm. outstanding note so the prudent buyer off of foreclosure is probably going to wait for it to go back to the bank rather than show up to the sheriff's sale and bid. Right. Because if you swoop in after the fact and say to the bank, hey, bank, you don't want this on your books. I'll buy the thing for you for 50 cents on the dollar. And that way, here's the cash. You can get it off your books right now if you sell it to me for, you know, half of what your outstanding note was or something sure. like that. And people shark banks out of yeah. foreclosed properties for that reason. Yep. Sometimes, especially the bigger banks, will say, okay, fine, we'll just take the hit. I don't want a property in Esterville. We don't want to screw with it. Littler banks are more inclined, I think, to 
put the effort in and try to recoup as much as they can and sure. and list the thing with the realtor and you know then it right so yep. but uh in between that time before it gets foreclosed all the way to the sheriff's sale and stuff there's certain debtor protections that you can assert like a demand for a delay of sale you can file a bankruptcy at the 11th hour Oh, There's sure. some stuff like that that can uh cuz if you file a bankruptcy you. you get to keep your dwelling. Well, but how does that If if the foreclosure petition has been initiated, it's a different story. So Okay. You can do you can you can extend it a long time. Yeah. But by filing that bankruptcy petition, they can't proceed with a foreclosure for a certain period of time. But you're going to get foreclosed on. Yeah, eventually. Yeah. Yeah. So, but if you did it before, if you knew you were, because I've always I've wondered that about fork about bankruptcy court. Mm-hmm. Like, I find that stuff fascinating. Yeah, because I know there's a bunch of rules. You get to keep a car to get to work. You yep. Get, you get to keep your house, stuff like that. Mm-hmm. How then? So say I'm going broke. I live I live in a house above my means. Mm-hmm. You know, say I had a great job. Yep. Got bumped down, took a fifty percent pay cut, and can't afford that house anymore. Right. Yeah. How does that then become affordable? Even if I go through bankruptcy, yeah, where I keep my house, and I assume the bank then gets to keep their lien of that mm-hmm. mortgage, like right. they're still entitled to that money. Mm-hmm. Even if you liquidate all my stuff, I'm not making that much money up. Right. And I get to stay there. Like, do you, your, does your payment then get lowered? Yeah, and extend it out. Or? So there's different kinds of bankruptcies. So what you're the situation you're describing is almost makes me wonder if there would be if that would be. Let's see, is it a chapter eleven or a thirteen or something? The chapter seven bankruptcy is the liquidation variety. So that's when. You do a, a calculus and look over and say, does this person, first of all, do they, their income level and this whole situation, do they even meet the requirements for a Chapter 7? Because if you're above a certain threshold, you don't, you can't even qualify for a Chapter 7 okay. liquidation. No it's, matter it's, what your No matter is. what, yeah. Okay. I mean, you can... I think you can get into a different bankruptcy as a place to start sure. and then get increasingly poorer and, and then roll it in, <laughs> convert it to a chapter yeah, seven sure. <laughs> and then you're really destitute. Yeah. yeah. But the, but the idea for a chapter seven is it's, it's the kind of the down and outer that's underwater on stuff and they've got a bunch of maybe unsecured debt or something mm-hmm. like that. There's a list of exclusions. Yep. Car, house, you know, tools of the trade, stuff like that. Sure. One shotgun, stuff like that. <laughs> Wait, what? Yeah, you can keep a you gun get to or keep two. One yeah, gun. there's like a, I think a gun or a rifle <laughs> exclusion. It varies by state to My state. My Remington it, safe. It depends on. <laughs> every state's got different, slightly different exclusions. Interesting, but uh, I think a lot of them are largely the same. But the amounts vary a little bit. Sure. But you can't have much cash in the bank. You can't have. Uh, your car value can only be to a certain amount, so you can keep a, keep a car, but it can only be like Bentley. seven or ten grand or something like that. <laughs> okay. Can't have a Bentley, exactly. Keep your house. Um, what about like secure, like uh, like stocks and stuff, that kind of assets? Yeah, I think that's so. Some of it might like retirement accounts might be shieldable, but I wonder if a stock portfolio or something but like that. if you're that, just or, sitting on like a Robin Hood portfolio. Yeah, or Bitcoin something. or something like that. That's probably, I, that doesn't make any sense that that would be no, excluded. I understand why like, retirement would Yeah, be right. So, but the other kind of bankruptcy is the reorganization variety. So that's the, okay, if I can get out of this or if I can lower this payment to that or blah, 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 blah. If I've got a little fat in my budget, say. Sure. And I can shrink, you know, the idea is you come up with a plan of what would work for your finances. Mm -hmm. And if you can stick to that plan for a period of time, and I think it's, I want to say it's maybe three years, then you can get the remaining debt discharged or something like that. Okay. It's kind of the basic idea. Sure. 
and that's a uh, that's the reorganization. I want to say it's a eleven or thirteen or something along those lines. I have to double check that to make sure. But and is that up to the court then to enforce that? So the the bankruptcy court will appoint a trustee. Okay. And there, that trustee is the agent that is kind of looking out for the bankruptcy court's interests, and the trustee will you your know, probation a, officer, kind of, yeah. Kinda so thing. That's financial the, probation. When like for Chapter Seven liquidations, when people go to there's a meeting of creditors, there's a requirement that has to be held at some point before you can actually get your discharge. So in between the bankruptcy p- petition and the date of discharge, there's this meeting of creditors held. And that's an opportunity for people Any- who are a creditor to show up and say, you know, shake their fist or whatever. And I mean, usually in a liquidation chapter seven style, there isn't much. Like, what do you want me to do? Yeah. There isn't any fighting really to be done. <laughs> Back when we had in-person meeting of creditors, COVID changed that around a lot. Yeah, we would cart down to Sioux City or Fort Dodge for the Is federal that where the courts are? federal court, yeah, okay. for the Northern District of Iowa. Sure, and uh, we'd have our meetings of creditors there, and usually it was like at the Sioux City Convention Center or at the Fort Dodge Library, and. <laughs> The trustee is just a attorney that does bankruptcy work. Oh, okay. But they take on all these cases as a trustee. Sure. And then they can, if they recover some stuff, I mean, they get a flat fee no matter what, but then if they recover some extra or something like that, then they get a percentage of it. Out of the creditor's cut? Yeah. So, yeah. So, like, if, if the trustee's digging into stuff and the guy, they found the guy shielded a snowmobile or something like that or whatever. <laughs> yeah tried to hide it or you know something like that they you know it's kind of a wild gig yeah it's kind of a wild gig gig. yeah you'd almost want a pi as a partner yeah right (laughs) well and you know i i don't know how tough they how hard they work really at at trying to come up with that stuff i mean maybe they i think there's probably a a level of due diligence that they do and then beyond that it's not much but you know, every so often there's people who file a bankruptcy or something like that, and they'll have a non-exempt real estate asset or something along those lines, but the bankruptcy trustee can't really glom on to it until, until that's there's a sale or right. something, So, but they'll take some efforts to get some sort of a sticker on the property, basically, to make sure that they get paid. Well, yeah, you'd want to... Something you'd want along to. those lines. I've run into that before. Interesting. With some title work and that sort of thing. Interesting. Yeah. Well, I think we would also get in legal. I've been watching a lot of law. Oh, yeah. Not, not law. It's like... Court drama. Oh, yeah, dude. Misdemeanor court. <laughs> Misdemeanor court in uh, Atlanta, Georgia is one Ooh, of my boy. favorites. That sounds juicy. Uh, there's another good one in uh, up in Michigan, in Ann Arbor, Michigan, that I watched, mm. too, on this... This law talk with Mike, this attorney out of Chicago. Yeah, you showed me that one time. Yeah, that was cool. Oh, man. And a lot of it's like TPO, like protective orders that Mm. are just nuts. Or, uh, God, the one last night was, uh, was like a custody. It was like family court stuff. Oh, boy. Those are, that's rough. (laughs) I'm just just like. And, and then you'll get the and most of it's pro se people. Oh, no, you know that yeah. makes that makes the best drums. Yeah, right. And, and these co- these judges are saints. Yeah, yeah. like it's the, a tough pa- job. The patience of these people, like to ensure because you have the right. Yeah, <laughs> like, I guess if you want to do. That. But yeah, it's fun watching them, like because you do get some leeway being pro se. Mm-hmm. I think out of like the typical order of operations oh, and yeah, stuff, right. you know, they expect a lot less out of me right. walking in than you, sure. the officer of the court. But um, sometimes the judges just lose it, mm-hmm. and it's so fun. Oh yeah, yeah, that's, that's good stuff. I get more than my fair share of uncomfortable court situations. And yeah, it seems like. 
I don't know, for whatever reason, personally, I've just had an unusual amount of stuff going contested here lately. Really? It's just like every other time I turn around, I'm in trial on something. They got it right. They got you got your right in motions. <sighs> Not a ton. Or is of, it you answering? Well, so I mean, the litigating that I do is largely in juvie. Yeah. So it's it's a little different than in like a divorce or a suit for damage for contract or something like that. Right. You know, something along those lines where you're going through more of a formal discovery phase or you're going through, you know depositions or something like that it's uh, the juvie stuff just doesn't doesn't get to that point typically which i mean and that's a good thing yeah well know. the 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 goal of like a for a china case for example the goal is to patch everything up right and the intent is, the is to help and usually the arguing is about what's the best way to help or something Unless you're to the kind of the fall off the cliff point of, you know, removals removals or, you know, like a termination of parental rights or something like that. But the fact of the matter is, if they're asking for a removal or if they're petitioning for termination of parental rights, it's not like it's baseless, usually. I mean, you know, maybe you could, people could point to, situations that were more borderline or something in their career you know or or somebody's overzealous or something like that but it's not it's not a first time offense typically yeah i mean the like those tprs in particular they come at the end of a long often long series of the state being required really oh, yeah. is the way to think about it, about it the state being required to intervene with court supervision and a family for something well, or and whatever then, and then the fact patterns already laid out in the in the oh, system yeah it's all there like, <laughs> there's there's no denying <laughs> so i mean like if the, so, some of the timelines to give you an idea of this so like let's say hank gets removed or something mm-hmm. He's out and now that's court ordered that he's out of my care. I've got a year to get him back in my custody mm-hmm. before the state could come with a petition to terminate. They don't have to. They don't have to. They could. Depends a little bit on your prosecutor, your county attorney, and stuff like that. Sure. And the circumstances, if the circumstances are such where. You know, maybe I need a little more time. There's a six-month extension that can be granted. If you still get to that point where that six... So now we're 18 months down the road of when... So now my kid is not three anymore. He's pushing five. And um, I still don't have him back in my care. Here they come with a TPR. Usually you can get those things kicked down the road a ways before you're actually in trial... Mm-hmm. And it'll take, I mean, it's unusual, I think, for them to rule from the bench and say, all right, you know. It's time to. It's time. So the decision probably won't be rendered for a period of time after you're done. So before the hammer drops, it's could be another couple of months or something. But if it's been that amount of time, like, what are the odds that you're going to win the TPR yeah. that you're yeah. that you've that you, you've magically come up with the kind of change required to change to negate really slim 18 months yeah. of not making not showing sufficient progress right. yeah I mean, maybe if you're starting to show progress after 6 months like mm-hmm. then they're like okay we got another year to really see if you stick right. with this and I think about the only circumstance that I can think of whereby you could pull a rabbit out of the hat at the 11th hour like that is if you could somehow prove because the DHS worker typically has got a lot of influence with how the case goes and what impressions are about things they're probably the closest plugged in they're the closest plugged in mm-hmm. they're you know and they're making reports to everybody and they're the ones that are informing at hearings and that sort of thing you know, if you could maybe somehow show that that DHS worker was 
fraudulent or sure. was, you know, had a grudge, had a grudge or whatever. But the thing is, and the, the thing that would make that argument hard to make, even if it were the case, would be like, where were you at every stage before right. when this was happening previously? How come you weren't pull, blowing the whistle right. six months ago or a year ago or something? So the the fact of the matter is, and it's because I don't I think the law doesn't want to terminate parental rights whenever possible. It's, it's a high burden. It's a high and, burden, and, it and it's be. and it's you know they they really give people every chance to mm-hmm. to rehabilitate and to and it, and it's a low bar as far as like being able to get your kid be. back in your care. I mean, you know, the fact of the matter is, if you can. Usually sobriety is a big issue, mental health. I think that's probably that, and, is that probably the biggest. Yeah, like the, substance and subs, oft, So usually, so if there's a substance abuse problem, kind of at the core of everything, if people can get sober, I've found that um, everything else kind of falls into place. Like. Then they're getting to their mental health appointments. Then they're doing med management. Then their mental health is better. Then they're going to their job, you know. Mm -hmm. And to to be real blunt about it, really the one drug that's the problem is methamphetamine. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. So, you know, I've yet to have a case where cocaine was at the center of the issue. Not not here. No. Not a thing here anymore. Uh, Really not a – I mean – it's there, but you know, it's, right. it doesn't become, you know, it's not the crack epidemic. No. It's and I, I, I haven't had a crack case before, it's but methamphetamine. most mostly what I have is THC and methamphetamine. Mm-hmm. And, well, you know, it's it sucks, but the, the methamphetamine in particular. And, and what about, about alcohol? Oh, yeah, alcohol, alcohol too. Alcohol becomes yeah. a big one. Um, alcohol is t- a little tougher because... It's legal, so yeah. And THC is starting to kind of get that same treatment as alcohol. Interesting. So it's, and I I think that's a good thing because I think we're wasting a lot of time with THC time cases. And money. Time and money. It's, oh, it's, yeah. it's silly. The fact of the matter is, you can use THC and not still be perfectly reasonable. You know, mm-hmm. I mean, it's no. No different, I think, in some circumstances, is having a glass of wine with dinner or something like that. I mean, like, mm-hmm. or, you know, I went out to party last night. In moderation. In moderation. Absolutely. You know, right. So. I mean, I mean, does it become an issue for pe- a lot of people? Absolutely. Yeah. But and so does alcohol. It, right. Um, so with when where booze can be a, a substance thing is... I guess what I would constitute an alcoholic, and that's kind of a high, especially with our Midwest culture. It's a high burden. It's it is it's a big a big hurdle. Because you, kind ha- of. you then you have to show you probably have to show legal involvement. Like you probably have to have yeah, a, a it, DUI, or right? A child endangerment, mm-hmm. with a, a DUI with a child right. endangerment, something like that. If you're just a drunk at the good old boy at the top hat or something like that. You're probably not gonna. Probably not there. You know. I mean, if you're, I could see cases where like DHS has become involved, and like a condition is you can't use alcohol. Right. Yeah. I think judges probably levy things like that. And that happens sometimes, you know. But because it is true too that once the hooks are in, sometimes more stuff is discovered mm-hmm. after the fact, oh, or, for the, sure. or new problems come up. Mm-hmm. That can be the case, but more often than not, I would say when substance is involved from the get-go, really it's the methamphetamine. Yeah, that's the problem. Which is interesting too. The the shift of when I first started pharmacy school, the huge thing was that people were cooking up crank with mm. anhydrous ammonia and Sudafed. Wow, because it it was newer. Uh, when I was in pharmacy school, I think it was maybe the year before or two years before Iowa had put in to place and the federal government had put Sudafed as the schedule five, Hmm. which means it can be sold over the counter, but it has to be behind the counter and there's restrictions on how much you can buy. So like your Allegra D stuff like that, where you got to show 
you got to be 18, you got to show your driver's license, and you can sure. only buy so much a month. Um, and I think that really actually was government solving the issue of people making it here. Mm-hmm. They don't make it here anymore. Yeah. It all comes all over the border. Mexico. All yeah. of it. Yep. And they'll do it. They'll, I was watching a thing where they, uh, they bring it over in liquid form or they'll soak like clothes. Really? In, yeah. It's easy to make it into a liquid. It's water soluble. Oh. Put it in a bunch of water. Then it just looks like water. That's crazy. And then when you bring it over here, you just evaporate it out, evaporate the water out. Really? Boom, you got crystal wow. methamphetamine. It's super easy to do. Hmm. And and that makes detection real hard. But I think I that's where it all comes from. I don't think any of it's homegrown. Yeah, that's interesting. Good old boys just cooking up some crank. Right. <laughs> well, <laughs> that used to be a thing when we were in high school. It's like, oh, that farmhouse out there in the middle is a, you know, that's a meth lab that or whatever. Cooks are out there cooking, cooking and you stuff. Cooking? Yeah, right. yeah, it doesn't, they don't do it. Huh. They don't interesting. do it. And it's because of the crackdown on the base. You have to yeah. have the ephedra or the pseudofed yeah. base and you just can't get any quantity anymore. Mm-hmm. Um, for a while at the beginning, they were able to, uh, and Breaking Bad did this <clears throat> in like their very first or second season, he, they would get Smurfs. They called them Smurfs and they would get a bunch of, you get 10 people to go to five pharmacies each yeah. because then it wasn't a centralized registry. Mm-hmm. It was, it was a book at each pharmacy right. wrote down the person. He looked at their driver's license, wrote down their name, mm-hmm. how much they're buying, then go to hy V and go do the same thing. Yeah. Now pharmacies in towns would talk to each other. If someone came sure. in and looked sketchy. Um, but now <laughs> we scan your driver's license right. into a national database that goes across state lines. So you can't buy your limit in Iowa, go up to Fairmont and buy some up there. Yeah. They talk to each other. I got beat up on that pretty bad. Cause I would get Claritin D for a cold or something yeah. to help myself kick a cold. It, and I bought some at the beginning of the month or something. Then I had another cold or was still dealing with a sinus infection or something at the end. Like I went uh, back to buy them. Sorry. No, you didn't pass mess. It's called meth check too. Yeah. You didn't pass meth check. It sounds awful. <laughs> the way to get for folks, I have folks, it, it, it really is the only decongestant that works. Mm-hmm. Other decongestants are just bullshit. Yeah. And uh, <laughs> yeah, I've had zero luck with it does not anything work. else. Get yeah. suited people. Yeah. <laughs> and and I have folks that have to take it year round. And yeah. uh, y- in that case, you can get a prescription for it, mm-hmm. which negates the uh, quantity limit. Oh, okay. Because then your doctor's monitoring right. and the pharmacy is monitoring how much you're getting a month. Sure. You know, there's still that check and balance there. But mm-hmm. where I was going with bringing up the legal stuff, I think we have to talk about. The Cheeto. Oh, yeah. Cheeto burrito indictment coming down. Yeah, right. Big news. Tuesday. What the, What are the charges going to be? Yeah, I'll be real curious to see. It's still I, sealed. Know. Still sealed. You know, I. it's a nothing burger, right? I pr- Probably. <laughs> I don't know. At I mean, this point. Yeah, it's, it's a first, but like. It's one hundred and thirty thousand dollars. They've gone In after the- Trump so many times and so hard. Oh yeah, and they've never gotten this and far. They, they never. No, I guess. But like this indictment thing is, it's nothing to me. No, I don't think so <laughs> either. I mean, the prosecutors love grand juries. My understanding is, at least, is because they're allowed to basically just. Only show them. Only nope. show their version of stuff. No expul- sculptory evidence. No, Is no, there... it's not a dip. It's not a back and forth procedure. No. It's just here's a prosecution telling their version of stuff. Do you and, think that this li- rises to the level where we should have a trial? Right. Is it? Is there probable cause to indict or charge? Essentially. Right. Then the next step is the actual trial where you have you know, the burden of proving the elements of the crime beyond a reasonable doubt. Yes. If we get to that point where here's a, here's a trial and a conviction and everything else, of course, then cool, you know, but in the grand scheme of things, like the, so these, the, the charges, unless they got something, but I don't think he's ever under oath. 
Like I don't think there's a perjury or anything. Because and it's uh, state yeah, charges. I don't know. It's gonna be a campaign finance violation. I suppose. Cool. Yeah. Like what's that a fine? Right. Can't you're not going to jail for that. Yeah. <laughs> so I don't know. And I then, mean And then there's the thought like how could you jail an ex-president? Mm-hmm. Yeah, I don't know how you could. Does New York want to try? Like, well, and that's because I'm so cynical about these kind of things. I'm always trying to think of what's the underlying political motive or the angle. Like, how how are the partisans trying to work this as their angle on something? Because it doesn't you know, hurt him. Is, well, that's just the thing. So it so like let's let's go down the th- the chain of thought that okay the Democrats are trying to sink him basically or because they're concerned about another Trump presidency or something right. like that they want to take him out of the equation. Is this the plan to accomplish that? It's I, a really bad plan. I don't know how. I'm not sure that works. Like because the the worst thing they could do is turn trump into some kind of a martyr right some jailed uh who's a south african guy (laughs) well and then okay so even even if because i i've thought about it this way too is it like the uniparty people yeah meaning the you know i've got an r behind my name and a d behind yours but we're cut from the same cloth type of establishment buying the same stocks right (laughs) The examples I use are like a Romney or a McConnell and a Pelosi and a Chuck Schumer. You know, those Those guys, the uniparty gang, they feel like dissent because I I, makes me wonder if the Dems think they're going to lose and it's like a foregone conclusion. So they want to try to take Trump out of the calculus because they think DeSantis is somebody that they can work with better. That, th- that thought has crossed my mind. I, I think don't know. That's valid. Yeah. I think that's valid. I mean, he seems more like one of them. Maybe not so much in his policy actions right now, because I think he knows that his R will, because he's not Trump, his R will gather the establishment Republicans because he's not Trump. Mm-hmm. I don't think the establishment Republicans will ever, like, I don't think Donald Trump can win another election. Yeah period yeah because i think he's lost those lincoln project republicans Mm -hmm. you know um but i think desantis wants to pick up some of those further right folks yeah and and i think that's what he's trying to straddle the fence between uh right the maga crowd and and the 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 mitch mcconnell's yeah yes and that's that's where i see his politic and is going with with what he's doing in florida right now Mm -hmm. because i think it's changed a lot to from what i saw from out of him even two years ago Hmm. talking like he he talked about being for trump he didn't talk about a lot of these uh changing up books and schools sure and the disney thing mm-hmm. like none of that was even on the radar hmm. and he's like going balls to the walls yeah right now down yeah he's in all in on that stuff it making seems a like. lot of changes and and pulling the uh the shipping up the the migrants mm. like yeah that's a uh, uh, unbelievable political stunt unbelievable man <laughs> <laughs> like, who has the balls to do that yeah <laughs> you know somebody that knows that they are the pick of right. the republican party and and so i think that's why i think they want trump out of it but it's not to me it doesn't seem like a smart play well, i think you just let him hang himself you let him go off on his own his pe- like but then the thought i guess is they need the MAGA mm-hmm. in the general. Yeah, they can't get over the hump without so that how, voting block. So how do you get through a primary? You got to try to make him ineligible. Mm-hmm. Yeah. You know. I think that's a decent analysis. Very well could be the situation. So. And what the Dems are going to do, who fucking knows? <laughs> well, I mean, they can't... I, Who's the heir apparent? I think the only one that makes any sense at all is probably Newsom. Yep. Yeah. Because I don't think 
Kamala does not. Kamala, Kamala does not. Yeah, she's not palatable, I don't think. Biden is deceased. And and they have hid Kamala. Yeah. Where What's she been up to? Nothing. Like, you never see her. Well, she, I guess. Doing stuff. You know, they must have some kind of a pipeline of the amphetamines for uh, Biden to get him revved up enough to do some sort of a public appearance or something. And Every they now and then. Shuffle him off. Lot. No, He God. doesn't do a lot. And... <laughs> He's just something, man. But, uh, God, with Newsom, the, the California stuff, though, that sure doesn't play in Peoria either. It's the other thing there. It doesn't. Uh, you know, that's... It doesn't. Isn't it crazy, though, to think that the last California president was Ronald Reagan? That is crazy. How how fast that's changed. Yeah, wow. And, and, I mean, I think that those pockets still exist, but California landscapes just change so mm-hmm. much, kind of like Bakersfield. Yeah. I think of that inner valley as, like, right. Reagan country down mm-hmm. into SoCal, and that's now just been everyone's left. Yep. Tax the balls off them, and right. everyone moves to Texas. Yeah. Jo- yeah. People jo- are leaving in droves, it sounds like. hmm When they say that about New York, I don't know if – I don't – I haven't seen data to suggest that that's actually the case, yeah, I don't but know. Um, I think you also have to think, at least I always do, and it doesn't really matter on the national scale of things, but like California, if it was its own country, would have like the third highest GDP in mm-hmm. the world. Yeah. <laughs> You've got a lot of resources in that state. Yeah. You know. But yep. they're pushing hard left because mm-hmm. I think they're doing like reparations talks. Yeah. Well, I know they were doing that in the Bay Area at least. Yeah. Which, Which is, you it's, know, that's a, a non starter. Yeah. I, it's just too complicated at this point. Right. You know, how, how the hell do you ever parse that out in a way that sent, makes any sense? You don't. And then, so, and then even if you do cross that threshold where you're cutting checks, how do you prevent somebody from coming back being like the way you handled this was incorrect incorrect or unfair or something? Where, and so where's the reparation on the reparation? Right. It's just a cascading domino effect thing. So, <laughs> oh, yeah. Crazy, man. Yep. Well, you ready you to it. wrap her up? Yeah, I think I better uh, go, go check that, on the pooch. Go let that puppy All right. free. Hopefully this worked.